and succeeded. So how am I going to work this soul? And I'm going to get a nice up close of the cross for those of you on Zoom. How am I going to work this stole in with this stuff? I'm going to come to <laughs> Well, we could do that. <laughs> well, the story of this stole is my father, mm, uh, what, 60, 70, somebody, uh, no, not 70, 60 years ago, uh, had studied and was ordained a priest. Uh, first a deacon and then a priest. And at the time, which is the early 1960s, uh, it was very popular for the wives of Georgia to be to make their stoles for them. Now, my mother was not a seamstress. We had a sewing machine. I still own it. It is still broken, just like I remember from my early childhood. I have never seen it be used ever. I, my mother did sometimes darn socks, but they weren't very comfortable to wear after she was done darning them. So the idea that she did this work, and just so you have some idea, because we don't appreciate the kind of handwork so often, but this is um, like a gold leaf thread. So you can't put you can't put it on a needle. You can't put it through the cloth. So what you have to do is lay the thread out and then use another very fine thread and do couching stitches across the thread to hold it. And if you're very good, and someday when I do other stole stories, you will see that that this is pretty crudely done. The uh, lines are not very uh, very straight at all. And it's obviously an extremely simple cross. And those of you who are here can take a look up close later. But it was a labor of love. It was a gift that she wanted to do. Uh, she was taught how to do this by another clergy person's wife, because in those days, clergy were all men. Um, and, and that person was really very skilled, and, and you will see some of my other stoles. You can tell the difference immediately. My mother did get better than this. She did. She made two of them. And so, um, so this is a labor of love. It is. It would never pass any test of any contest, um, and it's very plain. And and I I actually don't wear it too often because. Priests end up with lots of stoles, and, but I like wearing it every once in a while just to remind me and connect me. And so in our story today, of the, in the gospel story, we have two very different women, one uh, an older woman, um, and we need to remember that in those times, a woman who was bleeding was considered unclean. And an unclean person could not intermix in the community. In fact, uh, a woman, when she was menstruating, couldn't even stay in her house. She couldn't cook food for the family. She couldn't eat with the family. She was, uh, some of you may have read a book called The Red Tent. And they actually literally constructed a tent out in the back for the women to stay. And so the fact that this woman has been bleeding for was it a dozen years? I mean, she has been cut off from family, from friends, from community, from the synagogue, from the life of the, of the community, the daily life. She would have to go and get water at some time when no one else was around at the well. She would have to cook her own meals while somebody else was taking care of her family. The isolation, the aloneness, had to have been terrible. And all because of something that she had no control over. She had every right to be bitter, to be angry. She had every right to be really mad at God. She had gone to every medical person she could find for healing. 
And we are told they had all failed and she had spent all money. So not only is she physically isolated, but she is isolated now with no means of support. She is alone in the world with no means. But she has heard of this guy, Jesus. And she thinks, she doesn't think, oh, if I could just go and meet him, if he could just touch me and lay his hands on me, if he could just pray with me. She says, if I could just touch the hem of his garment as he passes by, maybe that would heal me. And we are told that she immediately, upon this, touching, senses that something has changed within her and that Jesus immediately feels and recognizes that power has gone out from him. Now, it's a nice story in that she is physically healed. But it's interesting, Jesus says to her, your faith has made you well. Not my, your touching me has made you well. But rather that faith that sent her in trust and hope to this teacher that was increasingly becoming dangerous to be around. That faith made her well. And she would have been well and healed even if she had not physically been changed. Come to the story of, of the little girl who appears to be upon death. And her father is the big wig in the synagogue. And in those days, the big wig in the synagogue and the occupying Roman government had come to an understanding of working together so that the Israelites could practice their religion instead of having to worship the emperor. But there were conditions attached, and they had to be exceedingly careful that they did nothing that would threaten the Roman occupiers, that would threaten their authority and their centrality. And so for this gentleman, Jarius, to go to Jesus means he risks literally everything. The leader of the synagogue would be kicked out for going near Jesus. He would be stripped of all of his authority, of all of his power. He would be condemned by the people. And yet, his faith, his desperation, sent him to seek help from Jesus, risking everything that he had, just as the woman had given up everything she had. Again, in this story, lovely story, the child is restored to wholeness when Jesus speaks to him. And that is what we all want, isn't it? That when, when we are sick, when we are faced with adversity, when tough times, terrible times, horrible things happen, we want Jesus to come and wipe it all away. But that doesn't happen in real life, always. People we love and care for die. Horrible tragedies come about not because of anything we have done. Indeed, you can only look at the flooding in Detroit um, from this past weekend and the people that have lost so much um, to know. Church of the Messiah, which is an Episcopal church in, in Detroit, um, who has a wonderful ministry of helping the people in the neighborhood uh, gain economic uh, ability. They actually run various uh, stores and programs out of their, their building, was flooded. Several of those programs were destroyed this weekend. Place doing Jesus work among some of the least in our eyes of Jesus' people. That tragedy shouldn't have happened to them, but it did. Just that tragedy happens in our lives. 
And it is not because of our lack of faith. To bring back this, my father was dead within a year of having moved this story. And so, a seeming tragedy. He had a whole new career and life ahead of him. My mother had grandiose plans, you know, back in the day, you know, the wife of the clergy person, you know, she ran the teas and did all of that kind of thing. You know, and had a mother like that. You know, but she did. Um, and so, it isn't always that the healing that we think is healing is what happens to us. I think the healing of my father's tragedy probably came perhaps for my mother some 50 years later when her daughter was ordained a priest, especially since she didn't believe in women priests. <laughs> yeah, that's always wonderful how our politics can change just as Jairus's politics change when we come confronted. But in every case, healing occurred. And it's important for, I think, us to understand that healing and being cured are two separate things. We can be healed and still not have the cancer in us. We can be healed and still not have the economic tragedy that has befallen us go away. Healing means we are restored to that relationship with Jesus Christ. We are so united with Jesus that in the face of tragedy, we find we do not walk alone, but we walk with our Lord and Savior. That Jesus is present. That Jesus can heal us in our brokenness. Cure is something else. It is wonderful when it happens. But healing is what we all need. Whether it is a large tragedy that befell us, or whether it is some minor thing that seeks to separate us from God. We are healed when we know we are part of the family of God, that we belong with one another, that we belong to Jesus Christ. So, just as Jesus said to the little girl, get up, and she did, and she starts dancing around, we are told in the midst of our tragedies, you are healed. Jesus is with you. Get up. Move forward. Continue to do the work Jesus has given you to do. Let us stand and reaffirm our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed, which are found.